Thank you, Alan. Again, a great presentation, picking up on some of the themes you've heard in some of the early ones. It's coming up to, to uh, five o'clock, so we've had a, uh, um, some very timely presentations. We've got now a, a good bit of time for questions. Um, so I'll throw the floor open to questions. If you do the, the, the panel the honour of introducing yourself, if you are going to ask a question, um, and if there's no opening bids uh, soon, I will um, open the batting. Graham Peart. Darren, I can't believe the book goes. How can we get rid of the wool stock pile, cut the flock by 4%, drop the dollar by 20%, and the price hasn't changed? Our plus the, uh, uh, the extravagant view of where China's going to buy clothes and rise to the level of European <coughs> purchases. Surely you believe. <laughs> Personally, I do believe it's going to go. <laughs> I questioned. I'm not the wool analyst. I have been the wool analyst. I'm on top of the industry very well. And I was reading the note, and all the arguments there to me supported a stronger rise. That is my opinion, and I queried him. He's over here. <laughs> um, and he made, he made a case to me that, obviously, not obviously, that the rise in nominal is going to be greater than the rise in real prices. But the strength of consumer demand is still relatively modest. It's not going down as it was over the past few years. It's just turning around. And so the, the consumer demand out of US and the EU, while positive, isn't really going to push it high enough in terms of pulling the exports, that export demand for apparel from its principal source market being China. On the Chinese side, though, there is good firm demand there, as we've seen from this, just this presentation here. So um, I respect what the analyst says, but there were just so many messages coming at me as well that. I wouldn't be surprised if there was some upside risk to our forecast and we'd see it perform better. Thank you. A good answer after that insulting start. There's another, <laughs> another question over here. Um, this one's probably for you, Alan. I'm Simon Rowe from Ocean Watch. I'm a, in my other days, I'm also a land producer and small scale wool. Um, where does the consumer get its perception that the Australian industry it, it is sustainable. Hmm. The environmental image. Uh, purely because of where the fibre comes from uh, compared to synthetics. A lot of uh, consumers know it is derived from crude oil, where cotton and wool is derived from sunshine and rain. So that's where it's sort of the perception of sustainable and environmentally friendly. Wow, there's a, a, that stimulated a, a, a bunch of interest. I think you were the quickest on the draw. Can I just follow up on that? Um, I noticed on the sustainability, 100% wool was 80%, but merino was down at 60%. Okay. Um, yep. Can you comment on that? Yep. Merino is purely, the, the, the term is not well known. So some, some of them don't associate merino with wool. So merino could be uh, we did uh, actually a uh, survey with in US, Italy, and all of those countries, Italy and China, a lot of people know what Merino is. You go to US, some of them think it's cotton. The some of them proportion. have no idea what it is. So is that term, they're not quite understanding. One of the, if the in a little bit more detail, the, the brand equity, we, we measure it using a company called the Nielsen Company. Um, the brand equity for 100% wool is much stronger than for wool blends, which the, the value of, the, of that word in the consumer's mind tends back towards synthetics. Merino is much less known. It's, um, the market researchers tell you that's a great opportunity because it's an opportunity for you to actually own it and to establish positive associations. And it's a great opportunity for us too as an industry, potentially, because 
there are some fairly strongly held and very durable negative perceptions about things like prickle and itch, okay, which uh, are real challenges for the word wool. Um, and it's interesting if you, for example, you're producing ultrafine fibres like uh, Michael is sitting in the audience here, then you don't want to really want to call your fibre wool when you're really competing against the cunia or cashmere or something else again. So we try and tease apart every six months we survey consumers globally about these issues. We, we try and track brand equity because if, if the company is investing successfully in the marketing, we should, should see equity rising. Okay, it's a, it's a key metric. The thing with Merino is it generally has less personality in a consumer's mind because they don't know it. There's a question up there. Yeah, um, Greg Lay from Suncorp Bank. Um, you talked a little bit about marketing um, to that um, middle level consumer. Is there a genuine understanding um, amongst the middle class um, in China of Australia's clean green image, or is that in all in our mind? Um, there's been talks in other presentations today about the uh, three in Australia. Is there actually genuine value in promoting that rather than individual brands? Of course, it is. There is. And the office in China is doing a lot of campaigning in um, major politan cities like Shanghai, Beijing and those area to promote the green side of things. And a couple of years ago, they bought a lot of designers, uh, very top of the class fashion brands over to see the Australian um, fa a farm. So that exchange of education and idea is great. Um, that, that, that really saw a lift. I think we need to continue educating and show them what the Aussie growers do in the backyard. Uh, what does it look like? It's extremely valuable in a milk powder sense. You know, the Kiwis have been extremely successful in marketing their milk powder over there. And part of it's the safety story, that it's, this is clean and safe. Um, extremely important. Up here, there's a, a question. Hi, uh, yeah, Hugh Cook, uh, Wolf, Marino Wolf um, Thanks for your telling your work on um, all the demand in China and all the sloppy. I think everyone here understands pretty well there's plenty of demand. What work is ABI doing on lifting the farm date price? Um, because as you know, uh, costs are rocking, but um, probably we feel like more work would be uh, better get towards farm date price. And if, if that's about, and I've got your work shows about value adding, so we're told the value yeah. adding. Um, and correct if I'm wrong, but I understand China has a 30% tax on um, value added wool in the form of uh, tops. Um, what happens there? Yeah. Thank you. You happy for me to answer how I yeah, thought you no, would no, be? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's great. I'll remember that. Um, a couple of things. Uh, AWI um, invests 60% of it, what it does in marketing, in terms of investment projects. 15% on post-farm R&D and technology transfer, the work we do in Vietnam, Belarus, Belarus, et cetera. So those two are three quarters, 75%. 25% of the project investment is on-farm R&D, okay? Uh, the targets for on-farm R&D are primarily about productivity and sustainability of productivity because you actually have to achieve both. Uh, in terms of the portfolio around, um, close to half of the portfolio in on-farm is directed to what we call strategy one in the STRAT plan, which is about health, welfare, and productivity. So that we've got, we're carrying some major investments in the area of um, uh, technology to help the industry address uh, breach strike as an issue longer term, both in a genetic sense, but also a technological sense. Uh, the genetics and genomics is in there. We put about $2.4 million this year into wild dogs, which for many growers, when I, I talk to major growers, for them that's the issue that'll mean they exit the industry in five years' time if we can't fix it. So that's, that's close to half the portfolio. About another 20% um, is in the area, area, area of harvesting. Uh, one of the major issues we get 
told about is uh, Shearer's shed hand training availability. You're basically competing against the mining industry. Um, um, productivity in the sheds, quality in the sheds, those sorts of things in terms of clip prep. We also invest in sustainability in terms of on-farm practices. Uh, we have an allocation that goes into the carbon area. Um, not a big allocation, fortunately. Um, and also, we have about 18% goes into um, what we call education and extension or technology transfer. So we operate nationally a network of grower groups. We, we fund the facilitator to work with growers on a small group basis. And we've been doing that since 2001 when I joined the company. Um, uh, Nuffield Scholars, uh, Breeding Leadership, there's a lot of work we do in there to grow new capacity and um, new young people. So there's quite a bit in the on-farm area in terms of productivity. Uh, we fund Merino Genetic, Merino Select, like the G National Genetic Database, weather trials, SAR evaluation. There's a fairly huge array of stuff. In terms of um, what we invest in to change the price that you receive at the farm gate, I think was the, one of the points you made. Um, the price that you receive at the farm gate is largely out of your control and my control, as, as you well know. Um, nonetheless, we, uh, we have representatives from FAR, the Federation of Australian Wool Organisations here, and we do quite a bit of work with FARO biosecurity. There's work on bales and bale size, those sorts of things. Um, there's also 75% um, of what we do is focused post, post farm gate. So the talk I'll give tomorrow at Tamora out of that Merino Link Day is primarily about Russia, Belarus, and Vietnam and the work we're doing there where we just ticked over before Christmas, I think 1.125 million kilos of business into Russia and Belarus which is, for us, it's huge. It's enormous from basically zero a couple of years ago. They're now back. One exporter's got a forward order for 800,000 kilos. Um, see, we desperately need to get more hands in the auction system, auction room. There's an enormous concentration. Um, so there's quite a lot that we do in that space. The Russian thing was basically, we took 15 wool buyers and exporters and took them over there and introduce them. There's still Soviet era equipment over there. What they totally lack is the, is in many cases, the experience of processing pure Merino. They need to technically compete against the Chinese who invested, like we as an industry, we've, we've had people for 30 years in China on the ground, training, helping them to upskill. Um, Barry Savage, Barry White. There's a, a list of names that actually you growers paid for. Uh, what's happening in Russia and Belarus and Vietnam is we're, we've, we're doing the same. So I guess that's a long-winded answer to what was actually quite a simple question. But there's quite a lot we're doing in that space. But the, the critical thing is more hands in the auction room uh, to bid for the product to assure the quality and make sure that we deal with some of the risks like biosecurity. South Africa just, uh, they, they, they couldn't export to China for two years because of their Rift Valley fever and foot and mouth disease issues, uh, which n for us beautifully correlated with that big price spike two years ago. It was wonderful for us. But if it happens to us, where we supply two th or 60% of the world's apparel wool, it'll it'll be devastating for the whole industry. So there's a whole array of things that we do that are very important. Thank you. Any other, yes? Oh, good. Thanks, Mary. 
I think at, at the producer level, and we look at technology that is adopted, and some of it's adopted really rapidly. The stuff that's adopted really rapidly, I think, is, is those items that directly affect the producer's bottom line. So this, the stuff that he can pick up, he can run with immediately, and it makes an immediate reaction or immediate change to the bottom line of the business. That's, that's, him, that's picked up and that's run and it's very quickly. And I think that, that's showed in some of the slides that I put up there and the pace at which some of that cutting edge technology has been picked up by the industry. At the other level, there's a whole host of other things which are those feel good things. It's, it's, it's the low level things that probably should be done. The, the bottom line to the grower or to the producer is not as imminent or you know, not as obvious. And of course, he gets into, into a comfortable position and he will, I'll do it next week or I'll do it next year or perhaps I don't want to do it at all because it doesn't relate to me. Every time the industry or a industry, and I think our industry is no different to any other, when you're pushed into the corner, you, you'll suddenly, you start looking out for changes that you need to make to improve your business. Uh, Along the way, um, we've heard you know, comments throughout the day about the RD&E effort. In Australia, I don't know that there is a problem in R&D. It's certainly there. I suspect we have a huge issue in E. And I was just thinking in one of the previous sessions I was sitting in where we've gone away from that departmental base of extension and it's now out in private enterprise. Now, in that private enterprise, it's being delivered by technicians who have a university degree in, in most essences. I wonder whether a core component of all our university degrees should actually be extension training. Because extension is something, when you talk to those people that perfect in extension, it is a science. And we're expecting people to perform in that area and they're not, not actually trained in it. And if you take 100 people out of a room, probably two of them have really good extension skills and, and can uh, implement change. The other 98 flounder. So whether that, that extension area is something that we really need to pick up in our tertiary education, if it's not going to be delivered by government, if, it's, if that space is in private enterprise, perhaps we need to upskill it. Yes, sir. Certainly in the stewardship of that product, it's, it's, a, it's an amalgamated program. So it's driven both by the biotechnology provider and it's also been driven by our own industry. And I think that's probably why it's been successfully taken up in that the, the programs that we run are not programs that have been thrown at us and said, this is what you will do. They're programs that we've, we've sat around a table for many hours and, and nutted it out and said, now, these are the outcomes that we need to, to get to. How can we achieve it? So when we get to it, it's actually a, a cooperative approach. And I think that's been the success of why that's occurred. You know, it, it's not the big stick. It's, it's the desire that, that growers want to have, they want to have access to the product. They want to have access to it over time. And if there is a cost to do that, so long as they, they can minimise that cost and see maximum benefit. So certainly I think the secret has been that, that cooperative approach that's made it work um, going forward. And I think, you know, most growers at the end of the day, their objective is to make money today. They also know that they have to behave in such a way that they also can make money tomorrow. Graham. On page 168, there's a graph of productivity showing uh, what's happened over the last 35 years for all the <coughs> industries. 
I've been here at every session for those 35 years. <laughs> and full in the, the full industry for the 25 years to 1900 is the saddest case of all. Uh, negative productivity growth for 25 years in a row. And yet for the last 10 years, wool has got the best productivity of all the sectors, cropping, uh, crop livestock farms, beef cattle, broad acre. Is there any analysis to show where the wool industry got that growth from, or is it because all the bills in the wool industry went into cropping? <laughs> 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 I'd like to claim that latter one, but uh, look, I might have a go with this, Carolyn, first. Or you, do you want to have a do you want to have a start, and I'll follow. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in that category of sheep and it just says sheep. It would the sheep, sheep industry yeah, is sheep. sheep and wool, and it's coming off from pretty poor beginnings because the previous two decades are negative. So, yeah. to turn around and to improve it, it isn't all that hard. Certainly, we saw the flock shrinking since the wool reserve price screen scheme finished and a lot of and then the wool price fell and a lot of producers left the industry. Those that remained had to do so by becoming more responsive and focusing on their flocks. Through the 2000s you had there were several drought years that really uh, got rid of even more growers, uh, wool growers and sheep meat producers and the shorn wool production continued to come down Wool prices weren't that flash. Meat prices were pretty ordinary up until about 2007. But still, the producers that remained had to be getting better. Those that remained had to be getting better at what they did just to stay in it. So there'd be productivity gains just by those who were in it being there compared to those who were so inefficient they couldn't make it go, but they left. There's an element of that. Then come about 2000, 2008, you saw a strengthening of wool prices and meat prices. and there was some real action that's gone on over the past five, six years where the producers that remain have become much more responsive to those, to those markets, both of them. So you would have the breeding flock, principally merinos, actually about four years ago. Now you'll have breeding flocks that are a mixture of crossbreds and merinos ready to be crossed if the meat price surges or to cross with a merino ram in order to meet the fiber demand. That's sort of the mid-micron, coarser wool ranges because that's where the greatest returns to a grower, for, to your average grower would be. The producers who are specializing in the finer microns, they've really specialized their operations to, to know what inputs they require down to the wire to ensure that their return is maximized. These are people who have been surviving in a very tough market and have been improving how they do things, investing in their pasture, soil management to get the best out of their flocks. And I think that's being reflected in those numbers. And we saw, uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry, I was going to say there's the first of the bars is for 78 to the peak of the reserve price scheme, basically, I think, Graham. So partly in there, people, the, the incentives from the market were distorted. So basically it was all about filling bales and, and heavy fleeces. And it was a very merino focused flock at the time, if I remember. Uh, the next period is, in effect, correlates pretty much beautifully with the collapse of the reserve price scheme. And there wasn't a lot of investment. In fact, there was disinvestment. Um, the other thing I'll just add to Carolyn's point is how the flock demographics have changed. Uh, it's one of those fundamental shifts that I can remember uh, where we've seen the dramatic exit of the, the weather population of our flock uh, through the 90s and in the first part of this decade so that we now, and I think Carolyn, one of your slides showed it beautifully, we have a very heavily ewe dominant flock now, the ewe lamb combination, whereas we had a big population of weathers before. So I think also in terms of the productivity, you've, you've got focus on a dual purpose, a reproductive unit or a stock unit as the Kiwis describe it, of the U plus lamb. So there's a number of factors that have contributed to that change. I don't think it's the dills have shifted across to um, cropping, particularly not cotton. I think that you just 
10 things that we've got back from the 40 million we've given you to innovate in R&D? I'm not sure what you mean, Graham. What are the R&D breakthroughs in this last 10 years that have given us a productivity growth? Uh, look, there's a, there's a couple of areas that are contributing significantly, I think, um, in part. But uh, the, the genetics, you've, this, this decade has seen us um, set up the National Sheep Genetics Database, for example. Um, that's a real positive. You've seen us seriously invest in grower groups extension networks around the country. So we have, we've invested very heavily in adoption. So it's about one in every five dollars we spend on farm is in adoption, the adoption networks. Uh, so there's a, there's a couple of things that have, have um, been key areas of activity. The other thing that's happened as an RDC, we used, the wool industry used to have the wool corp and ARAP and all that sort of stuff. Well, in the last decade, we've started co-investing with MLA big time. And that's also... I think a key part of what, what's been occurring is this harnessing of resources. Any other questions for anyone? Is it, can I ask uh, Carolyn a question with Chairman's prerogative? The Chinese are building a wonderful stockpile domestically and we in the wool industry have some painful experience with stockpiles and with their unwinding. Um, in the forward estimates, how do you see China? How do you see China's stockpile um, being unwound? Does it continue to grow, or does it plateau? And what are the what are the I guess the downside risks with unwinding? In the forecast, there is not not just in relation to China, so the global stock um, starts to come down over the medium term because we find we have production coming down and we have consumption continuing to increase and so instead of there, there being the balance the other way that leads to a surplus that goes into stocks finding some stocks can come out and start going into consumption so that's coming down whether they're going to come out of china or not that's uh or or a faster release of stocks from china than is there presently we haven't made any assumptions that way because that's going to depend on there being any strong, um, any strong export push for their textile industry that will cause the mills to require more cotton to meet the export demand. Um, in that case, given that we expect world production to be coming down, they might have to release their stocks mm. a bit faster to the domestic industry just to keep consumption where it is. Mm. And that's really just that supply. Um, su Supply, well, production consumption balance happening within China itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A further point to Graham's question about R&D. Um, I thought of another example which I think is highly relevant. One of the major programs in the adoption space at the moment is a thing called Breadwell Fedwell, which is about feeding and breeding sheep for maximum reproductive performance. It's based on a technology called lifetime wool production, lifetime ewe management, which costs AWI $7.9 million. We started funding it in 2002. The lead presenter is a guy, Jason Tromph. You might know Jason. The wool industry funded his PhD, which was on triple P adoption. Um, so our flagship program on getting merinos to have more lambs and the people who go through the program on average achieve between 10 and 14% increasing their weaning rate um, is based on some R&D foundations that date back to 2001 and, and earlier. Um, so that's an example. Look, it's uh, 27 minutes past the hour of five. It's very close to being drink o'clock. So are there any other questions? If not, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. I'd like you to give the speakers uh, a round of applause for a great, a great session. Thank you. Take everything with you as you leave, um, everything of your own.